Okay, so welcome to session three, and uh, I hope you had a good lunch. Uh, my name is uh, Unni Karunakara. I'm a physician and uh, was a humanitarian worker for uh, more than two decades, um, mostly uh, with, well, um, mostly with a medical humanitarian organization called Doctors Without Borders. Um, from 2010 to 2013, I was uh, its international president. Currently, I am a senior fellow at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs uh, here at Yale. Now, before I introduce the speakers and, uh, and the topic, I, uh, I just want to take one or two minutes to sort of introduce or, um, one of the programs that we're working on here. So under the ages of the Macmillan Center, so Professor Kushnud and I, along with other faculty members from across the various schools and centers, are working to set up a multi-country, multi-disciplinary survey of forced migration in some of the uh, top host transit um, and settlement countries. So this network, what we are loosely calling RefNet, will be the first ever effort to understand refugee choices and decision making across the entire arc uh, of the migration experience. So this will involve the development and application, for example, of standardized and validated quantitative and qualitative research methodologies to gain a, a much better understanding of the refugee experience. Um, and, and this will hopefully help us fashion better humanitarian responses as well. Now, one key objective of the RefNet, and you heard um, uh, Jody uh, Nelson speak earlier today, one of the key objectives of the RefNet is to bridge the gap between the formal international architecture of humanitarian aid and local civil society organizations, uh, whether they're led by communities or individuals or people affected by the crisis themselves. Um, uh, in, in 2015, um, the last year for which we have uh, information, a record $28 billion was spent on international humanitarian assistance. Yet, a mere 0.2% of reported humanitarian funding was allocated to local agencies. So $28 billion was spent on humanitarian assistance, 0.2% went to local agencies. But the grand bargain, which uh, Jody talked about earlier, aims to achieve a global aggregated target of at least 25% of humanitarian funding to local and national responders as directly as possible by 2020. So we've got three years left, and they want to go from 0.2 to 25%. Um, so you can, you can just begin to think of uh, some of the problems associated with it. So, uh, one of the things that we want to do at RefNet is to create a global network of practitioners and researchers that can provide leadership and build local level capacity whilst advancing knowledge, innovation, and thought leadership. So RefNet will hopefully raise the profile and capacity of local level organizations to embed a new norm in humanitarian aid where local level organizations are considered equal partners, which they're not at the moment very often, uh, rather than as the last recipients of a long chain of funding. RefNet will hopefully rebalance this relationship by putting the emphasis on learning from scholarship and practice, thereby improving the capacity of practitioners to better access knowledge and finance to deliver effective and accountable assistance. So it's a, you know, it's a, a ambitious sort of uh, project. Uh, uh, but what I want to underline is that this is going to be a multidisciplinary effort. So those of you who are interested uh, uh, should get in touch with either Kaveh or myself. And we will be working with other universities and other practitioners uh, in other countries. Uh, and hopefully, uh, pooling our resources together, we will be able to uh, help uh, uh, build uh, the capacity of local agencies to access funding from the international system and and and, and uh, spend it the best way possible uh, for their own uh, for their own needs. So, 
this sort of effort, I hope you'll agree, is crucial for countries to rebuild lives and livelihoods and also for individuals to safeguard their dignity and agency. So the panelists we have today will reflect on some of the challenges involved in rebuilding societies and systems, and particularly we'll focus on health systems. We have three professors from the Yale School of Medicine, and they will talk about three very distinct kind of experiences and, and, um, uh, and very interesting programs as well. But I've also asked the panelists to reflect on the necessary conditions uh, essential ingredients, uh, if you will, for post-conflict uh, rebuilding uh, to happen. Uh, and also, as because the symposium is titled The Next Generation of Humanitarianism and Refugee Studies, I've also asked the panelists to uh, comment on areas that need further research and support and how the new Macmillan program can work towards addressing these areas. So, you know, as a university, I think we should do some putting our heads together and see what uh, areas we need to focus on, what are priority areas. So I hope we can start that conversation. Um, I won't go into the detailed bio of, uh, of the three panelists. You can look it up in, uh, in the book. The first speaker is Dr. Uh, Ashka Rastagar. He will focus on Rwanda's post-genocide building of the healthcare system. And uh, Dr. Christina Talbot Siegel will talk about Liberia's efforts uh, to rebuild a resilient healthcare system in the middle of the Ebola, before and after, and in the middle of the Ebola crisis. And uh, Dr. Hani Mouafi will uh, talk about uh, uh, Syria and some of the work that is being done today at the moment to position them uh, uh, to, uh, to better able to uh, rebuild um, the health system and the health education system. Uh, so, uh, Professor Ashgar first, Rastagar first. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, Munir, thank you very much. And Hanan, thank you for organizing this and for inviting me. I'm going to talk about uh, Rwanda healthcare sector. I've been in Bobby, Rwanda for about six and a half years, and it's really one of the most hopeful uh, sort of events that happened after a major crisis uh, in terms of how a country can rebuild despite a, a major tragedy. Now, Rwanda is a small country, about 10 million, uh, surrounded by Uganda, by uh, Congo, uh, Tanzania, and Burundi. It's a landlocked country. It's a beautiful country with many, many hills, uh, almost no resources except for gorillas and tourism, that's basically, I think they have been lucky that they don't have any resources. As you can see, Zaire or now Congo has been raped because they do have resources. Rwanda has none of that. Now the timeline of Rwanda is critical to understand. It gained independence from Belgium in 1962. Uh, up to that time, between the two tribes, the Tutsis, which formed 15%, Hutus, which form 85% of the population. Tutsis were really preferred by Belgians. They were the ones who were educated. And when Belgium left, it was very clear that Hutus were going to be now the dominant force taking over the government. So between 1970 and the genocide in 93, there were many small events happened. Some of them were small genocides along the way because of the conflict that was built into the structure by colonialism. And during this time, there was very little that was really developed in Rwanda at that time in terms of healthcare structure. Many people immigrated, almost all Tutsis, from uh, Rwanda to countries near them, especially Uganda, but some to Europe, to Belgium, to France, and so on. So when genocide happened, which as you may recall, happened highly organized in an evening after the president was killed, when the hel helicopter was, was attacked. Uh, in 90 days, 10% of the population, about a million, were killed. So we're talking about a major event happening in a very short time. At that time, the Tutsi army that was in Uganda, headed by the president, Paul Kagame, came into the country, took over, and then 
uh, the post uh, genocide uh, rebuilding began. Obviously, there was chaos in the country because so many people had, had been killed. Both the public structure, private structure had fallen apart. And it took several years to really bring the country back to some modium of normality. Between 1999 and 2003, uh, there were now legislation, elections, and in 2003, the Constitution was approved. And part of that was the idea of inalienable right to health was in the Constitution now. Now, beginning a few years before that, uh, they had begun experiment in a small areas in terms of the structure of the healthcare sector. And by 2003, 2004, that became a national model that we'll talk about. So uh, the group that came back, the two cities that came back, took over the country, basically banned any tribal identification. So right now you cannot ask anyone what tribe do you belong to. But clearly because they were the ones that left the country who had been educated outside, despite meritocracy, many of the leadership are now Tutsis. So there is a still a major conflict that brews under, but the country is governed right now. And if you go there, it's quite safe. And it's really surprisingly a well run country with almost no corruption, which again is very surprising in East Africa. Now, what's the organization of the healthcare sector? It is highly centralized, centralized. so as it, this, the structure is defined centrally, but that is localized accessibility so that individuals can access healthcare at their neighborhood level while the data is generated, collected centrally, organized centrally. It is based on the focus on public health, preventive medicine, rather than on curative health. There's a network structure that covers the whole country. There's also now universal insurance. That really began with experiments in the late 90s, the so-called mutual, which is now uh, covers the whole country. $2 a head, you buy insurance, and that $2 a head allows you to then access much of the preventive, much of the primary care. The 16% lowest uh, income individuals who earn less than about 50 cents a day, they would not have to pay the $2, and that is free to that group. So the structure of the healthcare system is a pyramid with a large number of healthcare workers at the village level. There's about 15,000 healthcare workers. Those are selected by the elders, go through a very short-term training. They provide preventive care. Much of it have public health, vaccination, following pregnant women. Then there are about 400 neighborhood clinics uh, and health centers. Then districts to hospital, about 40 of them then about four to five provincial hospitals, and finally three referral hospitals in Kigali and in Butare. So there's a network system where there is a healthcare worker providing care at a local level, nurses providing much of the care in district hospital, and then further on, physician being involved all the way from district hospital all the way to the referral hospitals. The system allows you to actually move across very quickly from, if you go as a patient visit as our patient, and they recognize you have a disease they cannot manage, you refer very quickly to this hospital, you can then be referred to provincial or to referral hospital. If it's emergency, there is a way that you can actually go all the way up to referral hospital very quickly. So that's highly, again, organized. There's a very interesting network of communication using cell phone that allows that to happen in real time. Now, what is the outcome of this system? Preventive public health and then some curative health. As you can see, these are deaths in 1,000 live births. It went up dramatically, the green line that you can see uh, at the time of genocide. It took a while, and it's now actually is meeting the global health standards uh, for a low-income low country, much better than many countries in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. That's also true of under-five mortality, 
mortality primarily due to respiratory disease. Due to RL disease, it had dro dropped dramatically even from the year 2000 now to become about a quarter of what it was. If you look at, for example, AIDS in Rwanda, there was a spike of deaths from AIDS, again, around the genocide time. Took several years before it was highly organized, so patients were getting treatment. Now the death rate has dramatically dropped, also in AIDS as shown by the red line. And as you can see, the blue line actually shows the number of patients who are on treatment for antiretroviral treatment that dramatically increased at the present time. Over 100,000 individuals in Rwanda, a country of 10 million, who are on antiretroviral medication. This is looking at malaria. Again, the blue lines shows the rise again around the genocide time, and now the marked drop of both over five years, under five years, outpatient, inpatient malaria diagnosis. And finally, if you look at TB, another major uh, scrooge, major cause of mortality in a low resource environment, there's a dramatic decrease in both mortality from TB in younger patients, also in the overall population. So it has been really a very dramatic event that has happened, providing care as a preventive network care to the population. <coughs> this has resulted in life expectancy increasing from 33 in 1990 before genocide to now double that at 63 in 2012 and slightly higher now. Now, one of the things that AIDS epidemic did, because it brought a lot of money to Sub-Saharan Africa from PEPFAR, from Global uh, Fund for Malaria, AIDS, and TB, and from other organizations, they were able to build many clinics around the country. So access to care became very easy for patients who had AIDS and required treatment. If you got any of the dots with black in the middle of it, those are the full service clinics and there's a large number of them. The open ones are the ones that only provide care to pregnant women to prevent transmission to children. Now these clinics are actually becoming a health center also for non-AIDS disease because of the structure being at a higher level, a higher quality than the usual clinic in Sub-Saharan Africa. So they were able to use really the fund from AIDS to really expand primary care across the country. Now, one of the major issues in healthcare, other than having fun, having political will, really relates to the number of healthcare workers that are available to provide care. Nothing replaces that. And if you look at the data in terms of improvement in healthcare, half of it has to do with improvement in economic condition. The other half has to do with human capacity to create knowledge and then to apply knowledge be it in health policy, be it in preventive care, be it in curative care. Among the major issues in Sub-Saharan Africa is lack of human capacity. And this is now data regarding Rwanda. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide, they have one to 15,000, one physician to 15,000 patients. In US, it's one to 400. Uh, WHO recommends one to 10,000 as being the minimum more optimum, one to 2,000. We're talking about one to 15,000. Very few specialists, very few nurses for the whole country, and a healthcare system that depends heavily on trained individuals to provide, provide care. The number that most looks like being an optimum number in terms of number of doctors, nurses, midwives, as you can see, Africa has the highest burden of disease that's in dollars, has the highest and the lowest number of healthcare provider in the world compared to, let's say, Americas or Europe. But the ideal number that really gets you there is about 2.3. <coughs> but Africa is very far away from that number at about 0.3 rather than at 2.3 healthcare workers for the population. And this is, again, the referral system to, again, point out that the major care is given by community healthcare workers, 40,000 at community level, but only 600 physicians for the whole country. Now, uh, colonialism did not build institutions for Africa. These are the number of medical schools in Africa. 
As you can see, around 1960, where many countries were becoming independent, there were very few institutions of higher learning to train healthcare workers in Africa. Beginning with independence, multiple medical schools appeared and increased. But it's still a number for the population of Africa is a very, very small number at present time. So several years ago, Yale made a proposal to Rwanda. Uh, Michael is sitting there who headed the a group that went to Rwanda about six and a half, seven years ago, trying to get Yale involved in improving the institution of learning to train healthcare workers at that time. About a year later, while we were negotiating, Clinton Foundation walked in, they came in with a larger idea, and that became the project called Human Resource for Health in Rwanda. It's now at the end of the fifth year. Eight medical school, six school of nursing, one school of public health from Yale, two school of nurse, school of dentistry, began to train faculty in Rwanda for the only medical school, Rwanda National University a School of Medicine. Yale has been a major part of this event. Department of Medicine, Pediatrics, OBGYN, and School of Public Health have been playing a major role in the design of this program, execution of this program at present time. This program is unique in Africa because the fund is controlled by African. While the money goes from US and from Europe to Ministry of Health, Ministry of Health then independently negotiates with Yale to have faculty from Yale or sponsored by Yale to go there and train faculty. And this is now in the sixth year and has had a significant impact. I don't have time to show you the data in terms of training of the young physician, creating more school of nursing, the only school of dentistry, a school of health management and all of that is the outcome of this experience. So this was able to enhance the quality as well as the quantity of physicians and nurses in the country, develop a health management training program at the level of master's degree, increase the number of medical and nursing students, medical students are not double what it used to be, increase the number of postgraduate trainees in a specialty areas. The question really is, does this model called twinning model actually work in Africa, and I will come back to that. This doesn't replace the fact that there are still lack of resources to train subspecialists because of lack of adequate number of faculty and lack of resources to do that, and the sustainability is a challenge. So let me summarize what I have been trying to, uh, in a sense, tell you about Rwanda, which is that Rwanda has created a model which is really a model that has been tried in other country, in Cuba. The Rwandan model of healthcare is very much a copy of the Cuban model. Expending the same amount of money as Uganda does, there's a dramatic difference between the data from Uganda and data from Rwanda. So money is not the only answer to the problems, more than that is organization. And Rwanda has been able to create an organization focusing on critical aspects of healthcare, preventive care, public health initially, and then slowly not providing higher level care at the referral hospitals. Creating a network that allows the patient to move from lowest level of care to highest level in a fairly efficient manner. Now creating a model called twinning to train faculty for the healthcare institutions. Question for somebody who's interested in capacity building is, does this twinning model work in other places in Africa? Is it sustainable? Can it be scaled up to respond to a low number in a much more rapid uh, time? And finally, is it exportable? And actually my colleague, Dr. Christina, will discuss attempt to export this now to Liberia, where this model is now being used but modified, and again, Yell is heavily involved in that transfer now to see if Liberia can use the Rwanda model to actually improve their healthcare sector. Let me thank you. If there's any question, I am available. One second, one, Dr. Rastiga, uh, one second. Are there any specific clarification questions that you would want to ask? Any about Rwanda or? I, I have one question. Uh, Deciding on what the health system should be, the model, is a very political question. 
right? Uh, we know that from discussions in this country. It's a very, the, uh, so uh, how, were you part of some of these discussions on what system is appropriate for a, for a country like Rwanda? And uh, would they really go look at models, study models, and then make a decision, or it's just how it came about? Uh, our involvement was really at the level of how do you build capacity? That was a question that was posed to us. So the model was already there when we became involved in Rwanda six years ago. Uh, when you look at the country, it was very clear that Park Agami and the group around him came in with a plan. They knew exactly what they wanted to do from the beginning. And they already had to identify individuals who would be heading different areas. These are individuals who had been pushed out of the country but had become highly educated, Park Agami in Uganda, and many of them actually in Europe. So there was a connection among them in terms of what they wanted to do when they entered the country and what model they wanted to do. So the healthcare, it took several years for them to actually put together the healthcare model. But beginning before the constitution was approved, for several years they did experiments in three localities in the country to see would that model be acceptable to the population. And the model was a network model. So by the time that we arrived, that model was actually in place. The issue had to do with lack of resources, human capacity to actually improve the quality of the treatment that they were giving at that time. And that was a question that was posed to us. As I mentioned also, the funding being controlled by the Minister of Health, that's the first time that's happening in Africa. That the funders being in the US, primarily really, they have no control over the decision made in a sense. In Rwanda, Rwandans are running it. They are the ones who are asking Yale or Harvard or others to come and do the job. They negotiate exactly what they need to do. So they're very much in control of what's going on. That has been a challenge, but they have learned a great deal by actually managing this budget of this project, which is about $25, $30 million a year right now. A challenge for us, uh, better for them probably, but uh, let's uh, go on to the next speaker. Please. I'm Christina talbert Slagle, and I just want to um, echo Dr. Rostegar's thanks for having me here um, and for inviting me. I don't know where Hanan went, but anyway, it's very nice to be here, and um, I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to discuss these important topics with you. So perhaps I can pick up where Dr. Rostegar left off with this idea of can a model of rebuilding health systems, as has been done in Rwanda, be exportable to another country? So I'm going to talk to you today about Liberia, which is a um, post-conflict nation and also, as we are aware, a um, post-Ebola nation as well. Um, so uh, Liberia is located in West Africa. It's a small country. It's geographically about the size of the state of Tennessee in the U.S. It has between three and four million people. It has 15 counties. And as you can see, the flag of Liberia looks a great deal like the flag of the United States. And there's a long history with the US. Um, Liberia was populated by the US government with freed slaves um, th that were actually, they hailed from all different parts of Africa, but were, were settled in Liberia. Of course, there were already people there. And so there was conflict shortly after that, and that led to some of the, laid some groundwork, at least according to some theorists and historians, for a civil war that began in Liberia in 1989 and lasted for 14 years. Um, a little bit of history uh, before the Liberian Civil War, in the late 60s, the country, specifically thinking about health systems, established, there was a hospital established, John F. Kennedy Hospital in the capital city of Monrovia, and also um, a medical college sponsored by the Vatican and named after an Italian uh, surgeon named A.M. Dagliati. 
And that College of Medicine was, at that time, a, a leading institution in the West African region. So at one point, Liberia had, relatively speaking, a strong uh, health system and strong medical training structure that was essentially um, very, very heavily damaged by the 14-year civil war. The medical school co closed twice. There's only one in the country, closed twice during this 14-year civil war period. And so Liberia is a post-conflict nation. Um, so I am going to talk about Ebola a little bit, but this all ties together. And so I wanted to give a little bit of history of Liberia in between the end of the civil war and when Ebola struck. Uh, Liberia has a freely elected president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who is just now completing her second term as president. And um, around 2007, the Liberian government made an initiative to strengthen their health system. They introduced something they called the Basic Package of Health Services. And the focus of that was on um, basic preventative and curative services. And I'll show you a little bit of data in a minute about how health outcomes in the country were improved by Liberia's own national initiatives for health systems rebuilding post-conflict in the post-Civil War period. Um, then in 2011, following on the basic package of health services, there was something called the essential package of health services that further, there was focus on primary care, lots of effort made to rebuild the health system post-conflict. Then Ebola hit in 2014. And uh, I'll show you a little bit more data on that. And now they have, uh, again, gone backwards in having a very fragile health system. But there's an ongoing effort in the country to build and rebuild, really, a resilient health system. So the frame is now in more modern terms you hear post Ebola, but it is also still very much post conflict. So these data are from the year 2012. Um, a little bit related specifically to Ebola, but um, as Dr. Rastegar was um, pointing out, he, on the um, upper left is doctors per 100,000, and you can see Liberia had very low numbers. Also, you may have noted in my previous slide, I had um, 1 to 15,000, so these numbers are actually a little bit hard to pin down, and they vary depending on source. But at any rate, Liberia and the other two predominantly Ebola-affected countries had very low doctor to population ratios, weak health systems in 2012, despite the many robust efforts made post the Civil War to rebuild the health system. Um, then ETC there is Ebola Treatment Center, beds required, and that's in the thousands. So Liberia needed in January of 2015 2,000 beds and had, you know, 0.5 or 500. And then the health spending per person in Liberia is low relative to Spain and, and similar high-income countries. So despite many efforts post-conflict, pre-Ebola, Liberia still had a very fragile health system, um, and yet they had seen significant gains. So here, under five mortality is one good measure of health system strength. And you can see Liberia is shown here in blue. They, uh, they did have an increase, uh, a little bump in under five mortality in the 90s, but you can see a constant improvement in lowering numbers of under five mortality in Liberia. Actually, it's the lowest of the three predominantly Ebola affected countries in West Africa. And then also, these are all three countries. The middle box here is Liberia. In some other measures of strengthening a health system, these are, um, so family planning is in blue. You can see these are all pre-Ebola numbers. Um, Liberia had increases in the percent coverage of family planning in their country, in skilled birth attendance, and in immunization. So the country was slowly but surely rebuilding post-conflict pre-Ebola. And then Ebola hit Liberia in 2014. It started in Guinea in December 2013, spread to uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, and was a major, major setback for the country in their health systems rebuilding and uh, capacity. And the two things have unfortunately been hand in hand. So as we, I think, are all aware, Ebola treatment requires significant training of healthcare personnel, 
um, extensive personal protective equipment, Ebola, people giving Ebola care needed to be covered from head to toe and have training not only in how to give care but also how to put on and remove that personal protective equipment in order to keep themselves safe from transmission. And in fact, Ebola affected many healthcare workers. Um, we've done some work directly with the medical school. Some of the faculty there were lost due to Ebola and even some of the students. So it was a major hit to the country and a major hit to healthcare providers who, because it was already a fragile system, were not equipped either in training or in actual, uh, as Palm Farmer calls it, stuff, equipment, personal protective equipment, to be able to protect themselves and give care to their patients. Um, as a result, these now are data from, you can see the first, um, Actually, that says quarter 2014 compared to quarter one of 2014. But essentially, over the year of 2014, they saw a 50% drop in deliveries in institutions. People were afraid to go to healthcare facilities to deliver babies. Um, the, a drop in child immunizations. Uh, the medical school closed again in 2014. Schools closed, and people stopped going to work. So it almost shut down the country. Um, a drop in, um, in health care services in just the month of August alone, and then you can see two-thirds of the health facilities in the country were closed. So one of the things, uh, actually let me just give some real numbers, Ebola cost more than 11,000 lives in the three countries, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, and more than 4,000 people were lost in Liberia alone which was a tremendous hit for this little country and certainly for the entire region. Um, but they have, they have gathered and shown the same level of initiative and vision and commitment that was shown post-Civil War. So this is an investment plan, as it says, for building a resilient health system in Liberia. And I don't know if you can read the smaller text, but it specifically says, in response to the Ebola virus disease outbreak of 2014-15. And actually, this was written by the uh, Minister of Health and by senior leadership in the Liberian government at night during the Ebola epidemic. They would do whatever needed to be done during the day to try to address the emergency, and then all the time were saying, we have to, we have to recover, we have to do better, we have to build capacity. Um, and they identified, this is, a, in my view, a very impressive document. It, it shows a real strategic vis vision. It has benchmarks, um, lots of data, and importantly, it comes from the country itself. They identified three high priority areas, as you can see here. And before I talk about those a little bit, let me talk about what this word resilient really means. So this is, or at least what I understand it to mean and what I've heard people describe it to mean. So Ebola for Liberia was a massive and sudden shock to the system. And what happened to the healthcare provision networks, such as they were, given that they were fragile post-conflict, was that they turned to address Ebola itself directly. It became, to the extent possible, an emergency re response healthcare system. So the regular healthcare needs of the population were not being met. So women who were delivering babies, as you saw from the slide with the blue box, were not accessing health care facilities. Vaccinations were no longer being delivered, the things I've, I've told you. So this idea of resilience is to build a health care system that can simultaneously withstand a significant shock like Ebola and still maintain regular health care preventative and curative ser services. And it's been an interesting, actually, just a moment on what it means to build resilience in a health system. How do you do this? So these three high priority areas are Liberia's answer to the question, how do we build a health care system that can withstand shocks and still enable us to meet the needs of our population for ordinary, regular health care services? The first one is a fit for purpose health workforce. So just as Dr. Rostegar was describing, this is healthcare workers at every level of the system who have the training and the motivation and the skills and the support institutionally to be able to do their jobs. 
So there are, a lot, there are lots of benchmarks underneath this, but this idea of fit for purpose. You don't just hire somebody to give care who may not know how to do it. You hire people who know how to do it. You figure out how to keep them trained. You figure out how they're supervised so that they feel motivated. Figure out how to keep them paid on time. Fit for purpose. Reengineering the health infrastructure is really about buildings. And it's do we have the health care facility that we need that can meet the needs of the patient population that's in our catchment area? Do we have, for example, an Ebola isolation room? Many hospitals had no process for isolating a potential Ebola case. And they've made changes there. There've been, um, there's been introduction of infection prevention and control processes in their institutions. But this is also about making sure they have the buildings and structures that they need to be able to support the provision of health care. And then the last high priority, priority area is strengthening epidemic preparedness, surveillance, and response. So one major learning was how can we see these shocks coming and be ready for them and not have it shut down or redirect our entire healthcare system. And this is all, this is on the, on the web if people are interested. Um, you know, I enjoy reading this kind of thing. But it's a really impressive document in terms of how does a country say, all right, we were fragile before, we were rebuilding, now we've had this tragic setback. We need resilience. How actually do we get there? And then within the fit for purpose workforce, which is really, as Dr. Rostegar said, where we at Yale hope to support the efforts of Liberia, and this is again part of their specific vision in detail of how they want to see this happen, they've identified five what they call cadres, five categories of healthcare workers. And you can see them listed here. Um, it maps actually quite nicely. I don't have the picture, but to the pyramid of the different types of healthcare workers, thinking of what's happening at the local level, even in a very rural community in Liberia, community health workers, who's there. That particular cadre builds a lot on what Liberians themselves were able to do to stem the spread of Ebola. There was a great deal of community education of individuals who went out into their community and specifically were working to educate people um, and, and introduce practices, change burial practices to prevent the spread of Ebola. For example, they, they have this very cool way they do a handshake and then a snap. And they changed that and would um, shake hands by bumping elbows instead. So that seems to be a small change, but these were things that happened right at the community level. How can the government of Liberia tap into those community health infrastructures and build that component of their health workforce? Health managers, so this touches on some of the things I mentioned about how to keep people motivated. How do they know what their job is? When they come to work that day, are their colleagues there? Are they going to have a meeting to talk about where they're getting their supplies? How does all that get coordinated? So that's one component. It's almost a behind the scenes piece of the health workforce, but it's about making the system function properly so that you have what you need when you need it, whether it's gloves or some sort of personal protective equipment, medication, um, you talk to your boss or your manager and they tell you this is, this is our plan for the next six months. Then registered midwives, which is specifically, obviously, about skilled birth attendants. That's been a priority for Liberia for a very long time, post-conflict and certainly post-Ebola. And then physicians and physician specialists. Um, we, as I mentioned, have been talking with colleagues at the Seoul Medical School in the country about how to strengthen their physician training. And then our colleagues are also thinking about how to help support them as they build in specialist uh, training at the residency level. So this is to try to address slowly but in a sustainable way the low ratio of physicians to population in the country. Um, and then I should mention, just in terms of exporting the Rwanda model, it's been really interesting and, and, and very exciting to come into this work and learn from the way that things were done in Rwanda and have this comparison to Liberia where, for example, the government of Liberia is not making the financial decisions. There are many other players involved, many other funders. I think there were many funders involved in Rwanda as well. But the decision-making structure is a little bit different. And so it's been interesting to see that. Also been interesting to see how different academic partners elsewhere come into these um, processes and how we can support the vision there and be led by people in country. 
So I, I think actually I can stop there. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, and I don't know if we want to yeah. move on or. Well, let we'll let Honey do, and then we can take. Try to keep it short and keep it uh, get us as close as we can to back on track, but I can't promise a coffee break. So, my name is Hany Mwafi. I'm faculty in uh, the Department of Emergency Medicine, and I feel like a, a bit of a fish out of water uh, because I'm here speaking about a very different case. Uh, both in terms of personnel, Dr. Esgar, with uh, decades of thinking about how to do global health, uh, how to do education and global health education institutionally, uh, Christina, who has got uh, lots of experience in, in uh, healthcare management and thinking about these systems. Uh, I didn't start off wanting to uh, think about health systems or uh, medical education uh, in conflict. It was really I come from it more from the side of uh, both. Uh, service delivery, like actually going to work uh, uh, in the field or, uh, or as a consultant or researcher. Uh, but I kind of backed into it uh, in the case of Syria, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit how. So uh, there, there's a, I don't know if this is apocryphal or if it's real, but there's a quote attributed to Hippocrates that he would, who would become a surgeon should join an army and follow it because so much of the advances in medical education, specifically medical surgical education, do happen in, in, in wartime, both because of the spike in the number of cases uh, that uh, individual physicians see, as well as the opportunity to challenge dogma and sometimes be forced to practice a little bit outside of your comfort zone or your normal set of resources uh, uh, and be forced to innovate. So through that innovation, we uh, sometimes develop new skills, uh, uh, like tourniquets uh, to stop hemorrhage, which is the leading cause of death, uh, uh, or, or traditionally has been the leading cause of death in war. Uh, the idea of triage to better allocate resources uh, during war, uh, even blood transfusion uh, for resuscitation. Uh, we develop new groups of people, uh, new cadres of workers. So whether they are the uh, ambulance crews and uh, EMS personnel that started off in wartime and now we have in our, in our civilian life, these were people who were carried off the battlefield by the drum and fife corps. They're like the people that were the military musicians. They didn't have weapons or anything to do during the fight, so they would go pick up the dead bodies, which is, you can imagine, a less than ideal emergency transport system. But even the concept of uh, structured nursing and structured physician assistants and physician extenders to uh, push skills that can be done by other non-physician providers down to a larger uh, number of uh, uh, people, larger groups. Uh, these are things that we developed during wartime. Uh, and, and, and new tools. Now, we certainly didn't develop penicillin or antibiotics because of war, but the explosion in the use of uh, antibiotics actually really came out of the experience of the wars of the early 20th century. But, and, and, and of course, you know, new systems, mobile hospitals, uh, uh, air evacuation, et cetera. But this is all really different than what we're talking about now. These are all one-off innovations where uh, an individual or groups of individuals are forced to come up with a solution to a problem that they are facing, a very specific focus problem. Medical education doesn't work that way. It's not about one-off individual solutions. Medical education is, uh, a system that requires a very long lead time. Each, uh, each physician, nurse, uh, 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 nurse practitioner, physician assistant, what have you, community health care worker, they all require a certain amount of background knowledge, a certain amount of uh, training that they had received even prior to their medical education, and then a very long time in training before they actually are given uh, uh, the certification that they're free to practice. In most cases, this is more than a decade. Uh, so you can imagine the impact on, on health systems when conflicts decimate their, uh, their health, uh, health providers at, or uh, force them to flee. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, the other thing that takes uh, more than a decade is the average displacement. So this is, uh, these are statistics from UNHCR uh, looking at the number of uh, women, and, uh, men, women, and children who are displaced by crisis around the world, and you can see that it's 17 years is the average time refugees are uprooted from their lives. These are UNHCR statistics. These do not include the Palestinian refugees uh, that, are, that are tracked through UNRWA. 
So, and, and this uh, statistic of 34,000 people every day. So, so we know that when conflict hits and people are forced to flee, whether they are uh, uh, regular citizens or whether they are healthcare personnel, the average time that their life is disrupted and that they are unable to get back to uh, where they lived and where they, uh, and, and, and their work, 17 years, right? So it's, it's a fantasy when these conflicts happen that they're, they're just on the edge of turning, this is about to turn around any minute now. Even if a war stops, even if the Syrian war stopped today, right? It would be years before they had medical education up and running in the traditional system, and it's been going for five to seven years. So you talk about essentially a decade of absent health, uh, health care, uh, uh, health trained personnel. We also know that Syria itself, uh, this conflict is different uh, in its targeting of health care workers explicitly. Uh, health care workers in health care facilities were specifically targeted, uh, resulting in a, a few intended effects. One was to actually decimate the number of healthcare workers as a form of intimidation. One is to force these people to flee, and once essential services are gone, the thought is that civilians will no longer uh, remain. Um, and, and, and we know the long-term impact uh, that I alluded to uh, just before here. This slide uh, is a illustration of what were 433 attacks on 297 individual health facilities, resulting in over 786 deaths of medical personnel. Uh, this is a project uh, by Physicians for Human Rights where they triangulate reports from each of these points has to be triangulated by at least two independent sources, uh, where they describe both the numbers of the, the circumstances, the numbers of people killed, the uh, the impact of the uh, the strike, and if possible, they indicate. Uh, the mechanism and uh, and who were the actors. Uh, if not, they simply say that they could not verify. Um, and in terms of migration, so we, we're all familiar with the, the refugee crisis now, the worst in uh, more than 100 years, but the war in Syria's impact on displacement of healthcare personnel has also been profound. So it was estimated that there were 31,000 physicians in Syria prior, and I apologize for not having all the statistics on all the different cadres of healthcare personnel, but the physicians were most readily accessible. And so more than half of them have been displaced to other countries as refugees, and hundreds more, I alluded to almost a thousand, three quarters of a thousand, uh, that had been confirmed as killed. So we're talking about a country that is heavily, heavily depleted. Of the roughly 40 percent that are left, many of them are in areas controlled by the regime, leaving the large swaths of the country that are outside of the regime's control uh, to be uh, in, in desperate need of, of health personnel. But Syria is also different because of the ability for people to communicate. Now, the war started and they had a complete collapse of the, the phone and internet services throughout the country, uh, specifically in the areas that were uh, in opposition held uh, or opposition controlled. But what people have now that they didn't have uh, decades ago uh, were these. So these are sold rather inexpensively online and very expensively in Syria, but these are satellite phones uh, that are uplinks that basically allowed population centers to communicate with each other. They allowed people to communicate with family and, and, uh, and professional colleagues outside of Syria, and they allowed specifically the healthcare uh, uh, facilities to communicate with each other, which was uh, a, a, a game changer in terms of the, uh, the ability to reconstitute some of these health networks. And I have all of these uh, social media uh, icons up here because they too were used by people. Even though it's extremely expensive to be on a satellite internet connection, uh, th they use these not just for uh, socializing but for actual patient transfer, patient communication, and actually edu medical education uh, on an ad hoc basis. You can see here, this is, I'm not going to play this video, it gets much more gruesome than this, but this is a picture of a surgery being conducted in the M1 hospital, one of the trauma hospitals inside Aleppo. The reason that they filmed these surgeries was not to document the injuries or to say, look how uh, uh, amazing this surgeon is who's working. It was because certain hospitals were seeing certain cases much more frequently, and they were able to video the 
the surgeries to be watched by medical providers at other hospitals. I say medical providers because the person forced to do the surgery in any given hospital, right, may not be a specialist, may not be actually a fully trained surgeon. They may be a resident who is several years into their residency training. They might be assisted by a medical student who technically has not yet graduated medical school, but has been forced to undergo this kind of conflict-based uh, continuing medical education. So as, as I, I worked with this network of uh, physicians inside Syria to do analysis of uh, trauma data. And as we were going, we would talk about the types of patients, we would talk about the resources that they need, and then kind of afterwards when you're asking people how they're doing, you, the, the subject that keeps coming up is, you know, I'm really worried about my young doctors, I'm really worried about my medical students, you know, I've got three more that are scrounging up tens of thousands of dollars to pay some smugglers so that they can float out in a raft in the Mediterranean because they think that their life is going to be better. Uh, uh, or, they, or they're losing hope about staying. And we're talking about people that are incredibly resilient. These are people that were not the first cadres to go. They, they managed to stay behind despite extreme deprivation, extreme uh, uh, insecurity to themselves and to their families. Even the ones who felt it was unsafe for their families and forced them to leave stayed behind to take care of their uh, communities, but were beginning to lose uh, some of that hope. And, the, and when I asked, I said, what, were, what would be the thing that would give, uh, you know, these medical providers who are already so brave uh, a little bit more um, light at the end of the tunnel is that they said, well, really their biggest thing is that they feel that their life has stopped, that they essentially are trapped at whatever level they were in 2010 or 2011 prior to the war, and that there is no hope for them, and that there are no mechanisms even in place to recognize any of the work that they're doing now such that they could continue on with their lives as medical professionals in the future. And uh, so that was kind of the uh, uh, kind of social humanistic uh, impetus behind thinking about medical education in this ongoing conflict setting. But beyond that, there was a very practical need. There was a need to fill the pipeline for medical professionals, right? So there was this concept that, oh, the war is about to end. Oh, uh, they, oh, they crossed Obama's red line. Now the Americans are coming in. Oh, and there was every three to six months, there was some event that people felt was a turning point that the war, that we, we can just keep going on on an ad hoc basis because the war is about to change. And now we can see, you know, going into our sixth year that it's not about to change. And that, uh, and knowing that these systems take 10 years, you really need to start much, much earlier. Uh, and then lastly, there was, by a few of us, there was this idea of trying to prevent what is a war penalty for many people that stay behind and take care of their uh, friends and neighbors during wartime. Uh, they frequently, after the war, find themselves disadvantaged when people who left at the beginning of a conflict go abroad, complete their medical education, get additional credentials. When they come back, they tend, in, in many previous conflicts, it was those people that, the returnees that filled uh, positions uh, in, in the medical service, while people who have stayed, uh, just because there was no system to directly address their condition, found themselves kind of lost uh, be, uh, between the cracks. So we talked and we talked and we talked, and then we were kind of were apart for a few months, and I came back and I said, well, what, you know, what, what about this idea? They said, oh, we're, we're already on it, and they relaunched uh, Aleppo University. And they were actually faculty from Aleppo University, and they were very intent on calling it Aleppo University, and they wanted to not seed the, the title and imprimatur of Aleppo University, but I told them, you're going to need to partner with people outside of your little group, and it's going to be too confusing to have two Aleppo universities. You're going you're gonna to win an award and get a grant, and it's going to go to the wrong team. Uh, so they you know, agreed uh, ostensibly, at least in English, to call it the Free Aleppo University. And you know, this uh, is not just around medical school or, or health education. It actually encompasses medical, uh, nursing. Uh, they've got a, a, a class of dental, but then also humanities, engineering, et cetera, where they're basically trying to provide uh, a direction, a future direction for these uh, 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 hundreds uh, and ultimately thousands of students who are graduating each year out of their system. <clears throat> so here's just a, a quick photo of FAU Medical. This is the dean 
uh, who is Dr. Jawad, who's actually a cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, this is kind of in an underground area uh, to avoid, it because any time that the students come together, they're at risk of one barrel bomb could decimate the entire medical school. So they try to only come together in, uh, in areas that are quite secure, but you see them there, that's a microbiology class. So uh, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Hariri, uh, who also goes by uh, Abdul Aziz, we, we had him come uh, to Yale a few times, and we said, uh, you know, he gave presentations on the condition in Syria, and we said, what, what can we do to help? And, and one of the, the points that he made at, at the end is that we don't want to live as refugees anywhere in the world. We would like to go back and to our country. We want to rebuild our country. We can use technology. With technology, we can deliver information to students, uh, and those students will stay uh, to lead their health system, but we just need to be given the opportunity. So uh, with uh, a generous support of uh, several groups on campus, including Global Health Leadership Initiative, uh, Mike Skenekne is in the back there, and. Um, the Council of Middle East Studies in the medical school, we brought uh, some physicians from Syria, uh, uh, actually, uh, and then video linked with other colleagues in uh, uh, Canada, in Europe, in Turkey, and actually inside Syria, along with uh, faculty from uh, SUNY Albany, uh, to really sit around and say, what, how can we address uh, some of the needs uh, in terms of ongoing medical education? The challenge was to identify ways that all of us could contribute in a meaningful way to support this medical education in terms of both uh, NGOs, uh, individual physicians, and academics. Uh, so you can see here we actually had the video link up directly with the students at uh, uh, Free Aleppo University. So they were able to participate uh, in parts of the discussion and their faculty were, were online with us throughout so that we could make sure that we were developing something that was actually relevant to their education and their circumstances. Uh, so the plan was to leverage technology for medical education. We wanted to make English as a keystone skill because a lot of the resources that were available uh, online to help uh, do medical education are in English, unfortunately, uh, uh, only, and uh, very difficult to access. Uh, Syrian medical education currently has been done in Arabic. So we wanted to help provide them some of these English skills to give them access to these services. And we wanted to focus on basic science as a critical gap. We partnered with uh, uh, organizations to look at uh, some technology solutions. They don't, they, despite the overwhelming uh, number of uh, dead bodies in Syria, there is not uh, infrastructure, refrigeration, electricity to maintain proper anatomic dissection. So our students here at Yale use this visible body uh, 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 program and ones like it to actually uh, do a virtual dissection. We thought that this was a, 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 good, a good solution for uh, uh, FAU as well. Uh, there's libraries without borders. We have a significant problem with delivering information over uh, the internet to a place that has such restricted communications. So Libraries Without Borders has a device called a Kumbuk where it is both a little server as well as a little hotspot that delivers out to 20 to 30 individual uh, 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 users. So we are loading information and lectures onto these devices uh, to actually deliver uh, them to these decentralized campuses of FAU so that the students can actually uh, uh, continue. These are, these are Yale students that have been part of this effort and have uh, really been pushing this along and uh, in partnership with our uh, partners, the, the uh, Dr. Kamyarn Arash Alayi from uh, SUNY Albany. They have a program where they are actually able to do, develop, uh, take courses from the United States, uh, translate them in Arabic, deliver them uh, in partnership with the local faculty uh, in Arabic across the internet. Now, so I, I was calling this from MOOCs to MOOCs, so not just a massive open online course, but a massive open online course in conflict, right? Uh, so uh, the idea is to try to match the tremendous global resources, but really do some of the work to kind of shave things down to make it usable uh, for people under extreme uh, circumstances. Uh, the students have been doing peer-to-peer -peer networks and, and outreach, uh, but there's a lot of work uh, to be done, uh, a lot of research to be done on the proper implementation of this. Uh, and, and in terms of the effectiveness. The, the last very unglamorous, but I think uh, generalizable 
uh, problem here is the need for the administrative grunt work. Ultimately, we need to find ways to make sure that everything that is done now is properly documented, properly vetted, properly administered so that after the fact that these, uh, all of this work can be recognized. We're not going to be a credentialing, a credentialing body, but we want to create the, the materials that students and the faculty can present to credentialing bodies in the future. I'm just going to wrap up with a couple quick points here. So ultimately, the process of rebuilding, it's got to start at the time of the system breakdown, right? So in the previous two presentations, we were talking about rebuilding health care systems two plus decades after those civil wars, right? So, you know, I, I think that we need to start thinking as academics and humanitarian community of how we start doing these things from the moment of breakdown so that we can lessen the lag time and the gap. We need to establish some sort of recognition of credentials, and this is a general, general thing across, not just for health, but even for high school students. People who leave, uh, they are one, short, one course short of a degree. They go to another country, they say, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't recognize your trans, you know, please get us a notarized copy of your transcript translated into our local language, and then, you know, we'll run it by our uh, credentialing committee. These are not feasible solutions for people fleeing conflict, and we need to have ways of uh, having some sort of recognition of people's credentials, both for transitional use, so that when somebody is almost a vascular surgeon, we can recognize that they have those skills and be able to uh, extend the medical care, for, uh, for instance, in different regions and, and distribute it more rationally, and then ultimately for people in resettlement to be able to, and then, and then using technology to crowdsource some of these materials. Teaching online is challenging. Uh, I think it's a unique skill set. Uh, we're learning that online teaching in conflict is enormously so, uh, but uh, we're still in the modeling and redevelopment phase, but this is really driven by innovation, passion of the students, and, and there's a huge opening for academic consortia to support health education, not just in this conflict, but in conflicts in the future. I uh, want to make a plug because these students uh, are extremely deserving, and there's this uh, fundraiser that we're doing right now to help support uh, purchasing these coom books uh, uh, to deploy in the field. Uh, and with your permission, I'm going to just use. Um, how long is it? Uh, I'm not going to show all of it. I'm just going to show. Yeah. I, I just wanted to show a quick video here. We're not going to watch all of it. But uh, the video, the audio is not translating. Yeah, it's turned up maximum. Okay, now you speech will go back.
Essentially, the, uh, these videos are always shot from behind, and those women who are covering their faces, they don't, they don't actually normally cover. Many of these students, this is in a neighborhood just outside of Damascus. Uh, they're under siege. Their families uh, are, live and work in Syria, and they're afraid of their identity kind of being compromised and hurting their family members. So that's why they're this, this one guy said, no, I want to show my face. I want people to know uh, kind of what we're doing here and to understand uh, uh, what we're doing. So anyway, I, I know that we ran a little bit over time. I apologize, uh, but thank you for uh, your attention. All right. Three interesting uh, approaches. Um, um, I know there are a lot of questions. I have many, but I'll let you guys ask the questions. Uh, we'll take uh, about four or five and uh, and then uh, we'll ask the panelists to answer, and then we'll see if we have time for another round. Questions? Yeah. And let's try to ask big picture questions. No one? No questions? Oh, boy. All right. I have a question. All right, uh, so uh, this is for uh, Dr. Rastagar and whoever wants to answer it. Um, history is made by victors. So uh, in a country like Rwanda, how do the losers of the war, how are they part of any discussion around rebuilding societies and rebuilding systems? Um, in Rwanda, uh, they are still are going through a process of Maybe you can call it healing. Uh, those who are involved in genocide uh, have been tried by their own community. That's actually still continuing. This is now 21 or two years after genocide. So we're talking about a huge population where neighbors kill neighbors, uh, even genocide occurred inside a family and all of that. So the process hasn't finished, uh, really. Uh, the country is democratic in the sense that there is a vote to choose the president and parliament. Uh, but at the same time, you know that there's a lot of control over the society. And if you look from outside, I know Dr. Um, uh, Mr. Paul Kagami was here a couple of months ago, and there was also a clash outside his speech of those who look at him as being a dictator and those who thought that he was doing reasonably well. But if you look at the country that has gone through that kind of a genocide, there is always going to be a lot of fire under the ashes that are not going to be going out at this point. Especially because right now, when you look at the leadership, clearly it's more Tutsis than Hutus, while Hutus are 85% of the population. So the hope is that, that the issue will resolve over time, that with generations forgetting about genocide, building the country, that then there will be a cohesiveness as being Rwandan rather than being Hutus or Tutsis. How quickly that will happen, I think that's an experiment that's developing right now and it's difficult to predict future. But if you look at what Rwanda has accomplished compared to other countries, we work in Uganda, work in South Africa, in uh, Liberia, clearly Rwanda has made major gains in education, I'll show you healthcare, all of that while not being democratically run and in a sense being a country that is controlled by a small number of higher echelon at this point. But at the same time, this is true that there is almost no uh, uh, corruption in Rwanda, which is really, again, compared to Uganda, where corruption is very widespread. In Rwanda, you can work there without really being concerned that the funding is being misused, that really is unusual. So that has occurred, but I think the process of healing will take many generations. Again, another opportunity to ask questions. Yes, Nicholas. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting set of uh, presentations. Rwanda, um, 
One of the fascinating things that uh, happened there was the deployment of technology uh, and the rapid SMS system. Could you tell us a little bit about how that um, is being used, particularly in terms of maternal mortality reduction? One or two more questions. Any related questions, anyone? No? Yes. So let's. Uh, now, in terms of uh, technology, uh, I actually happened to be in a meeting with uh, 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 President Kagame at one time, and the question was put to me is, what model are you developing your country on? And he said, we want to be the Singapore of East Africa because we have no resources. The only resource we have is human power, and technology would be the support system. Uh, so they have really be began using that uh, probably more effectively than other places in the sense that there is a great deal of data collected on continuous basis in Rwanda so that the health centers are connected to Ministry of Health on usual basis. So they report malaria on daily basis, new cases. They report any unusual finding. During Ebola uh, event, a student flew from West Africa to Rwanda with fever, arrived in Kigali at a time that same thing happened in New Haven, by the way, where we had a student who came back to New Haven from Liberia with fever. The same thing that happened here actually happened in Rwanda, that that person was immediately isolated, information was given to the Ministry of Health, a set of organization was created immediately. Fortunately, he did not have Ebola, that team was resolved in three days, similar to here. So they were really highly organized centrally, as I mentioned. But again, the healthcare is really decentralized to the neighborhood level. That requires a great deal of communication between neighborhood clinic, district hospital, all the way up the chain to refer the hospital. They have actually developed that. But it's a small country. Rwanda is, has the highest density of population of any country in Africa. So we're talking about a tiny place. But because it's extremely hilly, uh, it's not easy to reach every place quickly. So the uh, uh, so use of technology has been very helpful in developing the, the healthcare sector. In regard to uh, the second question, which is the issue of political will, um, uh, I think you see that uh, in interaction with people, and I know you and I met the Minister of Health, uh, um, um, uh, Dr. Ines, very powerful woman. She knew exactly what she wanted. Uh, we are hired by Rwandan. Our boss, when we go there, are Rwandans. And she clearly knew exactly what she wanted to get done during the time that this was going on. I think that really comes from above that they are empowered to make sure that projects meet deadlines and that no NGO is there on their own. You cannot go to Rwanda and set a shop without being invited to come in. Even I visit Rwanda have to have an invitation to go in and do my work there. We can the door is open, you can walk in any time, mm -hmm. anything. So that is the system in which the higher echelon has already decided what model they want. Is transmitted further down. There's a weakness, obviously, that the discoveries from lower level doesn't trickle up very quickly. So that to challenge the system has been difficult. But when it works, it works reasonably quickly. Okay, we'll take two more questions. Kave and Kave.
I mean, there's, I think there's crosstalk happening between the three of us. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse I, me. <laughs> but I, but actually, I'm inclined to believe that it's really a, a different model, that, and that model hasn't really been developed yet. Because I think, you know, coming off of Michael's question, these are very long-term investments when you talk about uh, health education uh, 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 investments. But in the in the in the setting of being post-conflict, you can gather stakeholders around, and people can say, "Oh." I'm willing to put that type of money in. I don't think that anybody, Clinton uh, Global Initiative or anybody else, is going to put $30 million a year into mm -hmm. Free Aleppo University, right? Because it's seen as a highly unstable environment and there's uh, insecurity. These students are not even gathered in one physical location. Like they're kind of dispersed, and even within the country, they are they're uh, decentralized. So uh, I think it's it'll be incumbent upon us to develop other models. We heard a little bit in the morning about early childhood education. They're gonna, they're trying to get Sesame Street to develop materials to teach kids up to eight, right? Presumably not in a classroom setting, right? Uh, that are displaced and throughout. So I think there's a lot of room to be done in that type of innovation uh, for, around education, both in health and, and other sectors. Education. I was just wondering if you face any challenge introducing that concept because in a lot of developing countries the concept of preventive care does not exist. You only go to a doctor when you're sick. Um, so if you face any challenge and if so, what were they? My second question about Syria. Um, in your presentation you, um, meant you show a professor who when asked what can be done, he said I uh, just want to build back my country, create opportunities. Um, I don't want to be a refugee anywhere. I don't think any of the refugees want to be refugees anywhere. Everybody wants to see their country flourish um, to, it high, to its highest potential. But in many cases, people leave their countries to go abroad. Um, they um, go to school, they go to medical school, they become lawyers. Um, they stay in those countries, they practic practice law or practice medicine, and they don't go back to their home country. So to what the professor say, how can you motivate those people to go back to their country, especially if they come from areas with uh, <coughs> high instability? How can you motivate them to go back and to contribute to the country to what the professor say? How can you answer his question? Quick response. Yeah, let me uh, answer the first question. Um, in, in Rwanda, the major preventive care and public health area is done by community health care workers. These are three individuals per village selected by the elders who go through a very short course. which really focused on sanitation, on prenatal care, on following women who are pregnant up to the end of pregnancy, on uh, vaccination as a primary. But the vaccination rate in Rwanda is over 90%. It's really the work of the community health care worker that do that. They also are taught to di diagnose two or three common disease, diarrhea in children, for example, fever caused by malaria in adults and so on. Then they shift the patient quickly to the higher level, which is the uh, health center at that time. They, this model really developed in China called barefoot doctors in a village. <coughs> I work in Iran. That was the model developed in Iran. So this model has really been tested in different places. This is now on a very large scale. There are 14,000 community health care workers in a small country of Rwanda, and they should get credit for that. Just well, you can answer the second question. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. I, I would say very quickly, uh, I think what Dr. Hari was referring to is that it is extremely difficult to get people to return back mm -hmm. once they've gone and spent a decade getting training and establishing their career. Uh, abroad, so he's trying to change the conversation to be, "I will stay here unless," you know, uh, he w wants to keep the question at that level rather than "I will, I might return if," right? Which is what frequently happens when people have been displaced for a very long period of time. I didn't realize it, but uh, I didn't realize that I would be f focused on this. But I had a classmate in my residency who was a Liberian physician who was about to complete her. She was that person who was one course short. Right, she had she left, came to the United States, had to start over, get a high school degree, 
Mm -hmm. went all the way through medicine uh, or undergraduate medicine residency. So we were colleagues in residency, graduated together. I mean, Justina Mason, she's, I mean, is an amazing physician, but when I think of everything that she had to do to get back to the level, and many people don't, I, I think it's very hard then to tell somebody to, uh, to uh, necessarily uproot their life and go back, especially if it remains insecure. Yeah, I would just say, um, We've also talked about this with Liberia. There's a huge Liberian diaspora that is post-Civil War, many of them physicians, just like you said, elsewhere. And as we talked about um, bringing people in to do medical education, it became evident that once people are, have established a life somewhere and raising children, it's really very hard to get them to come back. Um, but there may be ways that, that we can tap into that diaspora population by, for example, connecting through some of these technological innovations, students in country to medical faculty who are Liberian who live elsewhere. Or uh, one of the things we've talked about, this is just an idea at this moment, but, you know, an endowment for the medical school in Liberia, I think that's maybe not possible in the midst of conflict, but now it might be possible where alumni who live elsewhere and are not going to come back can still contribute in a way that would contribute internally in country to building the system and improving the, the medical education there. So some creative solutions. So a couple of concluding sort of thoughts. Um, uh, brain drain is a serious problem, right? In all of these countries affected by conflict, it's the most educated who leave first. But forcing them back is not a solution. I think ultimately what they need to return is law and order and some sort of opportunity for themselves and their children and you know, their family. Uh, once that is in place, people will automatically, I think, start going back. Um, now, th this, I mean, I have a lot of questions to ask, but I won't. Uh, but perhaps there is a case to be made under Macmillan or maybe together with the School of Public Health to somehow document these stories to sort of learn what were some of the key ingredients that made those particular um, interventions successful. Because we still don't know. There's a lot of expectation on humanitarian agencies to deliver, but that's only one side of the coin. As we've heard from the Rwanda case, government determination, political will, knowing exactly what they want, not letting other people kind of boss them around. All of those are very important uh, considerations, and, and we could perhaps contrast that with what's, with what's going on in Liberia today, where everybody has a say in what Liberia does, right? So I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn, and perhaps under this new program, we should uh, you know, start, start to document and, and sort of understand these dynamics much better. Thank you. Uh, you wanted to add something? Uh, I, can I just yeah, very quickly. Um, so thinking about political will in Liberia, the, the story there was they were trying to rebuild their health system post-conflict, and then Ebola got the world's attention that the health system needed to be rebuilt. And so there's a lot of conversation now about this kind of potentially preventable crisis um, having been something that could have been foreseen and all the investment for Ebola now, it, how can we use, how can we capitalize on that moment and the awakening from the emergency to think longer term? So one thought on Macmillan is, you know, there are short-term problems and then there are long-term problems and how do we think about resilience the way that the Liberians have cast it where you both can manage an emergency but also think longer term rather than just continuing to respond to emergencies. Fantastic. So without losing much time, I'd like to invite Professor In Horn to come and deliver a lecture. No coffee break. You're welcome to step out, get coffee, and come back. <laughs> <laughs>